All right, well, let's let's get started here. Uh, so our next session, this is our second session of our meeting, and I'm gonna move my notes up here so I can actually read them without looking sideways. Um, our, our next presentation is by Wanda Roshinsky. Um, and the title is Sharing the Joy of Music, a Music Cataloger's Guide to Training Library Staff with Limited Music Expertise. Um, and I'll read her bio. Wanda Roshinsky is an original and copy cataloger at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, UTK Library. Uh, she earned her master's degree in Polish philology from the University of Wrocław, Poland. After graduation, Wanda worked in the Institute of Geography, Institute of Geography Library at the University of Wrocław. She came to the United States in 1983 and began working for the UTK Library in 1986. She first worked in the Acquisitions Department and then moved to the Cataloging Department in 1988. Vanda became a U.S. citizen in 1995. While working full-time, she earned her MS degree in Information Science in 2010. Vanda's specialty besides catalog music is in Slavic and French language materials, Batch loading of electronic resources and cataloging monographic ebooks. Vonda is also a NACO cataloger for the NACO Tennessee Funnel. She creates authority records for personal and corporate names. She received a uh, Music OCLC Users Group 2018 Ralph Papakian travel grant to attend the Moog annual meeting in Portland, Oregon in uh, 2018. And there we have it. Uh, like I said, we will be holding questions and answers after Vanda's presentation is complete. But if you have any questions that you want to start asking right away, um, that you can go ahead and type them in. All right. Thanks, Vanda. I am going to leave the screen now. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I need to click on that uh, icon. The uh, computer icon to oh, yeah, yeah. Help share, share your like, screen. You see, I panic. New platform. It's not Zoom. So <laughs> I need your I need your help. Okay. So I am here. How 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 do I go to do at the bottom sharing? of the screen? There's the little thing that looks like a computer screen down yes. there. And I clicked on it and I would say uh, entire screen or share. Or share, share a window. Or share You're window. doing PowerPoint, right? Yes, share I'm doing window. a PowerPoint. Okay, share window. So now if I click share window and click on share, uh, it should go when I choose my PowerPoints, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I think. Can everybody see Not share yet. slideshow? Okay, from the beginning. Okay. I don't we uh, Vanda, we don't I don't see your I don't see your slides yet. Um can you see. try to unshare and then share again? Yes, that's what I'm gonna do. And show and go to okay, go back. So because that share, it's not in blue when I click on it. So I'm doing something wrong. Should I click on? Click on the your PowerPoint. Are, click you, are you? What are you? You're doing PowerPoint. So yes. click on the thing. Click on window. Find your um, PowerPoint in that list of all those little tiny squares. Okay. So let's do again. Okay window okay and find my powerpoint here uh, it's not doing anything <laughs> ah. if i do entire screen the icons would disappear but the only thing choose what to share okay you, now i have blue no now now it's okay now okay I blue. something okay. happened and now we see your we see your folder yes right so if i go to my folder i would i would go to my final presentation bear with me please thank you very much where is my um mug and the last edited
Yes, this. Okay. Oh, oh, it wasn't open yet. It wasn't open yet. Right? Oh, it, it was open, but when I clicked, it didn't. It didn't, it didn't work. So I went. Okay, to, you. You're because gonna I went have to. Yes. You're gonna have to unshare, and then reshare. Stop and, yeah, stop share stop. and then I, reshare again because we were seeing. We just saw your your files. Um, okay, so I need to go back and and click on my powerpoint which disappear oh here it is okay now do you see powerpoint now not yet did you click share at the bottom in powerpoints or in the no no no, no. in in the in the hop in window yes sorry so, folks we um, we have these are technical things that we're still trying to sort out Yes, I know. Okay. So let's click on the go back to Hopin where you can see me. Yes, that's what I'm doing. I am using okay. PowerPoint now. Click on the uh, little screen click down there. Screen down there, yes. And now entire click on screen. window. It's not in blue. I need to do entire screen. Oh, okay, do entire screen then. That's fine. Entire screen. Okay. Yeah, share. Okay, and now I can click there on the PowerPoint. Something. Oh, now we have one of those things. Okay, this is awesome. What do we have? Okay, <laughs> we have too many windows. No, okay, so go ahead and um, open the open your slides to full screen. Um, I will do that. Yes. Great. And okay. You can make it into the uh, slideshow mode. I think that would be the best. Yes. yes, I. That's absolutely best. I am going to do that. Slideshow. And how about this now? Slideshow from, from the, beginning. the beginning. Yes. Oh, wait. Um, Is it slideshow slide slide from the beginning? There we go. Okay. Now, I'm okay. sorry, guys, about it. I got too nervous, and then I had a new laptop <laughs> with very unsensitive, sensitive tab when I touch it. So uh, all this nervousness that comes around. Uh, right. Thank you. Kevin, yeah, for, thank you, Vanda. I will be, I will be here me. if you need me, um, but I'm going to leave the screen. Oh, okay, great. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here for for my presentation. So the first slide here, the title you already have. It's based on my training. I was asked by my colleagues from acquisitions and interlibrary services to help them learn and be more aware when they work with music materials. So based on that, that uh, training that I have conducted twice, the first time in 2019, pre-pandemic, when everyone was present, it was in-person training, and we had a lot of people coming in I had physical examples of uh, music scores of uh, and variety of uh, music formats. So this year, just a week ago, I will ask again because we have new employees to do the same training. And I thought maybe share my experiences and what I am doing in helping other non-music oriented people or non-music trained people when they deal with music cataloging. So why does uh, do the training for, for that? Many academic libraries are unable to commit a full roster of library staff to handle multiple workflows required by a music library, including ordering, procurement, cataloging, and processing of music materials. Oftentimes, librarians must rely on support from library staff in other departments who may have little to no music expertise. With such shortness of music expertise, how can we improve a workflow of music materials from acquisitions to the end user? I conducted, I conducted a training session for acquisitions and interlibrary borrowing and lending staff on different formats of music scores and how to evaluate their catalog records. The session included examples of different types of scores and their catalog records in Mark 21 format. The goal of this training was to improve acquisitions and interlibrary services staff ability to place orders for the correct types of music scores 
and uh, other related materials and to evaluate the materials and receipts to match with the other records. Overall, the increased knowledge can save staff time and increase efficiency of the workflow from ordering to providing the end user with a requested item. So who needs the training? Actually, I think all library staff and library system staff that deal with music materials will benefit, but usually catalogers need more specialized training. While in reference services of a mid-large academic library within a large university system, uh, uh, we have uh, centralized operations, including uh, acquisitions, cataloging, processing, interlibrary lending and borrowing and systems, that training is very useful for exposing and uh, showing people the language, which is uh, uh, challenging also, the language of uh, music vocabulary. So who needs the training? It was already there. We also have system limitations. System limitations and word cut, where additions filters does not recognize the distinction of formats and manifestations. And interlibrary lending and borrowing platforms also do not distinguish manifestations or formats correctly. Like I will show the example of UTK interlibrary borrowing and lending service form. Discovery tools have replaced traditional catalogs and lack in the ability to apply filters and uh, provide the granularity that is needed. So, why is this training? Working with music materials presents, this is this, this stuff. Working with music materials presents a degree of higher complexity than working with book formats and hence the challenges that come with it. To address them, we need to be teaching about differences in manifestations and formats of music work. We need to show the importance of an editor of a music work. There is a greater number of editors for a particular music work who are also instrumentalists, pedagogues, and because music is also subjective when it comes to interpretation. Also teaching the strategy of searching for generic titles of music works, titles describing just the genre or generic terms such as mazurkas, um, concerto, mass, etc. Let's see a patron is coming and asking that he, she need uh, uh, to request a score for Beethoven symphony. Which one? Also rules of searching are strange and library systems produce different results depending on library systems. For example, many libraries indexed the preferred titles of music works, but the title proper in Mark 245 field was and still is often non-indexed, especially true for older publications and older catalog records, which in the 245 field of Mark record have the first indicator chosen to no other entry. In these instances, especially for generic titles, mostly catalogers would know how to search for and find the needed bibliographic record. They know, for example, to search for a string quartet using plural form and apply filters accordingly needed and limitations and so on. There are also challenges searching for distinctive titles, especially for non-English languages titles and dealing with search results that provide many bibliographic records also for non-English languages of cataloging, records describing the same manifestation, same edition, and so on. It does not help that there are so many records for the same manifestation, many of which are encoding cataloging level M for machine derived, confusing further staff searching for a matching bibliographic record. So, 
we also encounter that was my fault sorry we also encounter system limitations where WorldCat doesn't distinguish uh, formats and manifestations. And I already said about interlibrary lending and about discovery tools lacking on granularity. So what happens if we do nothing? We may continue to see many challenges and pitfalls like in these real life examples I will show. And this, uh, on this slide, for example, an interested user wanted the concerto score version for two pianos, but we ordered the full conductor score. Realizing the mistake soon after, we ordered the other score, and now our library owns both editions. I showed and highlighted also here on, on the slide borrowed from my training for uh, conducted last week, the information provided by the publisher which is highlighted here and in yellow, and which is in French language, when the different description between these two editions, where the conductor score is of much larger size and uh, with so many more pages. And also there is a differences in the titles. The first record of French language of cataloging available at the time of placing order, clearly says in French, réduction pour le do piano, Therefore, this is a reduction for two pianos. Therefore, acquisitions people need training. Vanda, this is Kevin. Yes. yes. Can you do one favor for us? Can you yes. click on the bottom of your screen? It says uh, there's a sharing um, button. Yes. Can you click the hide link on there and make it go away? Um, it's covering some of your slides, so we, we had a request. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. It, it says stop okay. sharing yes. and it says hide. I did, I did that. Oh, no, no, yes. no, you clicked on. No. I click on something wrong? Right above that. Do you see it? It says yes. hide. There we go. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I was annoyed about that, but I didn't know what to do about <laughs> okay. it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sorry for the interruption. So, uh -huh. No, no problem. Yeah. So... Did I? Okay. So, new, you know, the, the challenges that, that we did say, that slide was about the information provided uh, uh, from the uh, Canadian French publisher, and it was all in French and it was confusing what to order. So, new employees in acquisitions department are often confused and come to me asking for help in searching for bibliographic records in OCOC connection. What are all these barcodes, UPC, ISMN, EAN numbers, and publishers' vendors' websites? In this example, a colleague was copying and pasting the barcode number from a publisher's site into OCOC connection and searched for it in indexed uh, ISBN numbers. This search didn't bring any results because the barcode wasn't the ISBN barcode number. Therefore, acquisitions people need training about unique identifiers of music scores and how to search for them in connection. I am also frequently asked for help in searching for the bibliographic records when publisher provides limited information searching with generic titles, names of composers in non-English or not known preferred name form. On this slide, I want to acknowledge that this slide and next slide are courtesy of my dear colleague and uh, music librarian in UTK School Music of Library, Natalie Christoph. These two slides are examples of her unpublished bibliographic instruction course the bibliographic instruction is provided for students in music school, but there are valuable examples and instructions that would also benefit all staff dealing with music materials. So next slide shows the challenge of searching for title. An acquisition staff received a request to order a music score with a generic title. We must teach the strategy of searching in OCLC, WorldCat, and other library systems using filters and limit the results to improve relevancy and limit possibly very large recall. 
very good example and challenging is, uh, for example, Stravinsky's work titled The Right of Spring. It was first published in France under the French title Sacre du Printemps, but the preferred title, and it is in Russian, is Viesna Sviashtiennaya. So imagine the very few people know this work under the actual Russian title. This example, it shows the further confusing matter of Romanized transcription of non-Latin scripts, such as the Cyrillic here. An interested user wanted the music score with the provided plate number recorded in Mark 028 and was provided information about the title and edition. The search for plate number brought this beep record, but it was still confusing because the title, the statement of responsibility, plus edition information are all recorded here in Romanized transliterated from uh, Russian Cyrillic. So finding this record needed further verification with someone familiar with the script and transliteration. For instances, as this one, I created templates in uh, Ex Libris's Alma New Metadata Editor for <clears throat> creating a brief order records for music scores, for audio recordings and for video recordings. Thankfully, nowadays, it is so much easier to copy text in a script and or language from the internet site and paste that information in a brief order record. The challenge of working with this publication is in recognizing what is in the title. The uh, composer's name doesn't look uh, familiar, transliteration, which starts with C.H. Tchaikovsky, and information about the specific information uh, about manifestation. So verify what to order before the wrong thing is ordered. It's always an extra step that people in acquisitions need to do. <clears throat> Another challenges are limitations and discovery platform, for example, of uh, Ex Libris Primo V. A user saw a call number for a high voice score by chance in Primo V E in a browse search for LC call number and was interested in ordering edition for low voice. Results of this search indicated that library owns only edition for high voice. The other two LC call numbers, one for medium voice and the other for low voice, are not displayed here. And that's the second music work titled The Leader Opus 27 by Richard Strauss and the call number with the signifier that this edition is for high voice. <clears throat> but our library owns all three editions. Displayed on this slide are results of searching with the LC call number in Alma's uh, new metadata editor browse shelf listing. Clearly, we can see all three call numbers indicating the voice ranges, high, medium and low voice. Voice range terms, in addition to that, in the bibliographic description, are transcribed in German language in the text in Mark to 50 field, where for high voice it's vier hochte singstimme and for the medium voice vier mittere singstimme. So we have these limitations that, challenge, that are challenging for people who are not trained like music catalogers are. Searching in bibliographic record in WordCat is helpful, but also it may be confusing. So when all collated formats are there in one place, when an, by mistake order music score instead of uh, electronic version, instead of print publication or audio recording instead of printed music. And the aim of this training was to uh, let people be aware about unique attributes of music materials, staff to be aware about the importance of description and detailed description, importance about uh, recorded instruments and voices, 
about being aware about uh, whether the work was composed or arranged and whether it's for piano solo, solo or violin solo without accompaniment or with accompaniment. All this detailed focus recorded information is crucial in identifying records to use for ordering the material for local libraries. We have also uh, some pitfalls and challenges uh, that uh, people in processing encounter. A user needed to borrow music parts for performance. We have a procedure for putting parts in pocket. Preservation processing staff pen bands, soft cover scores and puts pocket for parts. So parts, sheet music can be removed to be able to be put on a music stand. User, however, received parts all bound together. Well, parts were sent back to preservation processing department for separating them back. The mistake was corrected, but the lost time of waiting for the parts by the user and the cost of redoing the pen, pen bounding could have been avoided. So this is a real example how library systems sometimes failed us. This is a screenshot of the UTK interlibrary uh, lending and borrowing form. And uh, in the bottom here, uh, there is a question, will you accept an alternate edition of this item? And most of the times this is preset as yes, or uh, people not knowing exactly may manually say yes, or interlibrary services may click it as yes. So in this scenario, an intention was to order um, print score, vocal score for the opera, but we received an audio recording instead. Here on this slide are two examples of, of the results for the same search done in WorldCat and another in Stanford Library Search Works catalog. A search using keyword search, and I just put Beethoven, piano, concerto, score, where results were also limited only for music scores. Stanford Library System displayed records with facets to choose from 29 genre terms for this search results, while WorldCat Limited Search Blue Checkboxes on top um, provides the choice for download that music, download up music score and for manuscript music scores. Uh, but the results also include records for other formats such as LPs, books, DVDs, mixing all formats and especially not distinguishing yet between genre. Therefore, staff in library systems need the training and although systems are constantly improving, we have a long journey to provide more granularity, distinguishing between manifestation formats and editions, especially. So uh, I just got uh, next screen. So what are the pitfalls if we do nothing? Ordering rock music score takes time to reorder and purchase. Uh, makes a decision whether uh, vendor or publisher takes uh, mistaken order back or we force to keep it or wants to keep it. The workflow of ordering and receiving is disrupted and extra time is needed to solve the problem. And sometimes it is difficult or not worth the time and money to return the item back to the vendor. So the library suffers the consequences of it, such as accepting an item not desired or accepting a duplicated copy of an item already owned by the library. So on the following scores, I will, I will just share, <clears throat> I will just share some, I will share all slides from my training conducted a week ago, but I will briefly and quickly go through them to show how in pandemic time, without uh, being in person at the training and without having uh, items at hand, uh, I try to teach people about uh, different notated music formats and editions and such. So this is where my presentation started. It was done last February 
in 2022, which I started with the introducing for the introducing nouns or introducing terms, which are appropriate terms that are recorded in bibliographic record. They are formats of notated music. Catalogers have access to RDA uh, tools and uh, all other tools that are under our fingertips, but people in other departments uh, usually do not use these tools and they are not familiar uh, with accessing and learning when they are confused about uh, terminology. So my presentation started with definitions taken from RDA Toolkit Glossary and uh, it was in an order of that first slide of the accepted terms for notated format music and definitions uh, were then uh, followed with showing how notated music looks that uh, what is the staff and uh, that staff may have sometimes some numbers on it and uh, tablature of guitar so just to familiar familiarize with them with non-text material as uh, uh, printed staff notation and i uh, presented uh, identifiers plate numbers recorded in mark 21 records explaining what is UPC, ISMN, EAN, and call numbers, and how to search for them, and uh, what mark field records are used to record this information. I also presented that we can limit, uh, especially searching vague uh, general terms, by format. And doing that, we excluding bringing, and we all know that we excluding that they don't, we excluding bringing the recall also for other formats like books, DVDs, and audio recordings. So, did I mention in my presentation for MOOC, this is when my colleague came and said there is no record in OCOC for this barcode, which wasn't ISBN. But when we did search it in correct index, for standard number, it did produce nine records. And I explained, um, yellow highlighted to, to my colleagues that uh, they're gonna see records in uh, not only in English language of cataloging agencies, but in this example, they saw the first two in Danish and then in German. And I did say about choosing the best record is uh, looking for the quality of matching bibliographic record. And also when they see held, it's a signifier that our library owns it. And letter D, which is the symbol of the Library of Congress, signifies that Library of Congress originated that bibliographic record. We can further teach them about the strategy, how to search for plate number or publisher number. And the first strategy, uh, they can use command line search if they know how to use commands, but it's very easy now to just from pull down menu choose publisher number number and search for the same plate number mm304 as a second strategy both strategies bring the same results no difference but if we further have more information about known publisher name the same search from the pre previous slide I showed to people if they add publisher name in publisher index for publishers' names, they would only retrieve one very accurate, precise, and relevant record. I also introduced, uh, uh, and my intention is to introduce them uh, about the uh, uh, challenges of uh, languages, of barriers, uh, of language barriers where edition statements are not only English language, but they are also in Russian, German, French, etc. So uh, this vocabulary from Yale University Library, I love the website too, and uh, introducing them what they can see in the Mark uh, uh, 250 field and signifying this is an edition. And if we are interested in is Daniel Pierre Clavier, which means the first edition for piano, we should be ordering that. And another thing is about edition for voice range, high voice, for example. It's not always showing in bibliographic record. So I explain that if it's a part of the title, grammatically linked to a title or subtitle, 
it will not necessarily be recorded in 250 uh, mark field, but only in 245. And I did uh, presented them um, the description and it is limited, they are not catalogers. So I emphasize they may see in 300 field, uh, described one score, uh, two scores, scoring four volumes, and what the difference is and why they see this. And importance for emphasizing is interested user, if we need the score and parts, we should be ordering score and parts, not parts only. And then if we ordering a performance score, and the subfield V in subject heading that may be confusing for non catalogers is saying two piano scores. So, why in one 300 we have written two scores and in the other 300 down the last example, it's one score, which I explained that we do have the concertos for two pianos and performing from one score uh, when concerto is for two pianos would be impossible. So, even if we receive an order one score, we need to reorder the other one to have two copies. And then second subject heading is concertos piano, which means it's just uh, for one instrument, solo, piano, and then uh, the piano scores means that uh, it's reduced to the all orchestral part in, uh, in one staff notated in uh, music. And then I went into the examples that I had physical uh, examples of in 2019 when I did screenshots of uh, cover and try to, whenever I had a room for, put also the definitions of it. An example of the title into 45, into 60 or to 64, uh, publisher information, date, copyright, what have you, and 300 uh, description, physical description. So we went down uh, with, uh, in in the order of the terms for notated music from the first slide when I introduced them, um, choral music, and it may be choral music, but it's also a study score. And what is the chorus score? An example of the notated uh, uh, staff music uh, screenshot here. We could order condensed orchestra score with solo piano and all orchestra part, they can see it visibly here, the first line of two uh, on the staff, two staffs, one staff, uh, orchestra line in the first one, and then piano solo in the second one, and a description. And then interesting, I brought as an example physical items in 219. This time I just have screenshots of covers to emphasizing that the difference and one of the attributes of music uh, uh, public, in music publications and music manifestations is that the same music work may have different manifestations. So the first example, and I did run a Vivaldi's preferred title and several next slides after this one, uh, telling them first off the preferred title is in Italian language. And this music score is for four seasons, which we know this is English title. And this is it. on top of it, full score. When I did uh, on the right uh, show that all parts uh, for, uh, for solo violin and principal violin, and then the violin strings one, two, viola and basso are all in vertical order in the score. So it has all the parts recorded. Then we have the same music manifestation, not manifestation, we have the same <laughs> preferred title and all four concertos. But this publication, it says on the cover, Partitura, which in, in, in Italian means uh, score, full score. So Partitura, Partiture, and recorded in 250 edition, which is important to be aware about it, that we want to order this full score of the same four seasons by Vivaldi or concertos. But this one, it's different and it's small in size and it, uh, and it has the description study score. What is the study score? They do have a, a definition and one good uh, way to use this tool is that it's keyword searchable. So when they have electronic version of my guide, they can click in the term uh, study score, find the definition, go to the next find, and that would bring them examples and they can look at it and be more comfortable with the terminology, with the language and uh, with what they are ordering. 
And I did say that we have miniature score and study score, and these are not necessarily equivalent. Some publishers do think so, but miniature scores, it's mostly the size of the publication, not larger than 23 centimeters. And a miniature score may be a study score. And it is study score, we cannot perform from it. But study score may be in octavo size, it may be 28, 31 centimeters. And the same music work of Vivaldi, four seasons, and here we ordered only parts and definition of a part, an example of violin part, an example of notated music for the first violin, only one staff lines for all the music uh, transcribed in here, and uh, in the description, five parts. So it's not one score plus five, five, plus five parts. Another example of study score that I did show, 19 centimeters. This one shows the whole orchestration and the piano solo in the lowest uh, staff in the notated music. And the full score doesn't mean it's a large work, it's a big work or big volume and it has a lot of parts. So I did show them just the work for a string trio and showed them the screenshot of the <clears throat> of the public of the cover and then the first page of notated music for full score and then these three parts that are all those and they will be put in pocket and each part has always a written information what instrument this individual part is going to be um, needed for violin viola and cello plus in a description and it's important to pay attention for them is to look at it and say we were ordering one score plus three parts. So we cannot be missing these three parts when items that we've ordered arrived. And these challenges show about dealing and having barriers with, uh, uh, with French language. And I already did show in my MOOC presentation, these are the screenshots from the um, Alma, um, brief displaying two order records here. And one order is for the, uh, by mistake, order at uh, conductor score, and the other is one for the reduction for two pianos. And I did show them uh, for, MOOC pre for MOOC previously, the same slide that it's here, and emphasizing that conductor score, we almost never, I don't think we order in for our library, conductor score is of very large size, and we have Knox Swiss Symphony Orchestra that has all conductor score and all these parts for performing. But for music score in our library, we are focusing very often on solo part with piano accompaniment, reduced size, orchestra size, or um, chamber music, especially for, for performance. So an example of other um, quatrième, the fourth concerto score reduction for two pianos. Original work was for piano and orchestra, but this one, an example of notated music, it has only two staffs and not the all orchestration in vertical order that it's so full on the page. And we come to, to show this uh, earlier mentioned uh, edition for high voice and piano that mainly I try to explain the difference between vocal score and what's not being a vocal score, but also being careful about uh, and watchful for all these terms that are important, that are different one, and differentiate one edition from the other. And on this example, the part of the uh, edition statement, law signifies this is an edition for low voice. And it might be a catalogous judgment uh, it was decided that this is edition statement that belongs in 250, but in 245 we have only Ariete Aubrie for voice and piano. And then vocal score and an example in West Side Story, everybody knows. So I did uh, those screenshot of the vocal score cover or was that title page. And then an example of the Aria Sang by Tony, something's coming, and uh, an example of the vocal part for Tony in first staff and then in the second staff uh, accompaniment for piano. 
And out of curiosity, I have never worked with table book. I uh, did show them and I found the uh, image and Googling for it, but the definition of it and what it is. And uh, it's very interesting, actually. So ordering is also detail oriented. And this is the bibliographic record. And I think I have these slides uh, display. Uh, in bibliographic record, one describes one score and the other describes uh, uh, one score plus five parts. And uh, what we have ordered, it was one score 42 pages. What landed on my desk was one score plus five parts. So I needed to clarify whether we intended to order one score and five parts or full score. But what happened is I found out we already own in the library one score with five parts. So we duplicated the order of something that we already owned. So in conclusion, why does non-music library staff need basic music training? Staff in acquisitions and in the library services became familiar with music terms, with variety of formats of notated music and importance of editions, editors' names, uh, paying detailed attention what the description of music was provides and what interested end user really wants. And what are the expected outcomes of it from my training in 2019? People who went through that training already improved the efficiency of the workflow from ordering, receiving to providing an end user with required item. And the last week training was the aim to train, retrain people from uh, to be more familiar with the genre, with the jargon, with uh, uh, terminology and with formats and editions, and also for especially for new hired employees. Provided training guide in electronic format is easy to use and navigate to see the examples that they would like to refer to. So resources used and thank you. And if you have any questions, I can end my presentation. All right, Did I Vanda, quit sharing? Thank you. I yes. will remove the share just a second. Yes. Great. Okay. There we go. All right. Thanks, Vanda. That was, uh, you know, no, that was great. I, I, I'm just, I'm surprised that, that there, there's so much information that we, as a, we as a trained music cataloger, you take for granted and you think, oh, this is, this is something that, you know, it's just, I know this. And then all of a sudden you have to teach it to someone who doesn't know anything about music and it becomes this really overwhelming task, it seems like. So I'm, I'm really, um, I think it's really amazing what you've done. Um, we have time for questions now. Um, if you all want to use the Q and A um, in the on the right column, please enter some questions there. I don't see anything there yet. I'm just scanning the uh, scanning the chat, and I don't see anything there. Although Casey did mention that that now he knows how to pronounce "right a spring" in Russian, which he. Um, I thought that was. I yeah. like that. I like that example from Natalie Christoph uh, in, in instructions. So I told them I'm gonna steal these two slides. I could not resist it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, come on, folks. We have some questions. I have one question. I mean, I, I have two questions. Um, so there was a, there was a significant in, improvement in their performance after you did the initial 2019 session with, yes. with paper yes did you well, notice I, any differences between i mean how did you you did this in virtually after COVID started um last you week noticed? Last okay week, so that was the like, first virtual version this is did. yeah this is the first virtual version last last just last week so i did have uh, i did have uh, received feedback of people really thanking me that they can they have this tool this guide that it's easy to use and uh, from my last training i actually from my experience from the training in 219 
which really I brought tons of physical items to share. And the screen was, the screen was much larger. And it was, I provided the full bibliographic description, highlighted important of uh, uh, Mark 21 fields for them to focus on and, and forget about subject analysis and all other stuff. I mean, they need to focus on uh, important, really it's a jargon in music and it's important terms that we're familiar with, but for them it's all, all new. And on top of it, it's it's new in English, and then they have it in uh, <laughs> non-English script or in German or French. So there are challenges. So after my training in 2019, actually before people that if people didn't were not sure if they found a good record, they they came to me, helping uh, asking me to help to find the record to use. And there were many occasions when there wasn't a record in OCLC and bibliographic database yet. So that was the reason that they came up with was, it was idea to create uh, templates in metadata editor. So now when they need to create an order, they don't have in, in, enough information about, uh, bes no, they are not misleading me, bringing a score uh, without parts. And then I am receiving and what lands on my desk is called with parts. So, the main, main confusion is uh, between vocal scores, parts versus uh, scores and parts and scores. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the conductor's scores or, or you know, what is conductor's score? And even if they <laughs> translated it, even if they translated that French term, uh, uh, you know, that the score is through the chef, it's for conductor, they wouldn't know what it is or mean what, it, what is that. So uh, in occasions like that, situations as such, uh, they are using now templates. And I know there was not enough information and I could uh, contact music librarian and go from there, or I have enough information to create original record and, and so on. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have some questions now, so I'm going to read them aloud so that they get onto the recording. Um, first question from Antoinette. Uh, when I've tried to talk with music, with non-music colleagues as a group, I always get a lot of blinky faces. <laughs> How do you start? <laughs> Actually, interestingly, I was asked for this training by uh, people from acquisitions, staff from acquisitions, when there were many occasions when I returned the score and said, contact the publisher. Did we receive the wrong score? Or I say, we didn't receive what we ordered. What did we really intended to order? So checking the order record and actually uh, it improved by me requesting uh, by music subject librarians to provide information. So it is recorded in order record. And since my training from 2019, when staff in acquisitions know that they're supposed to be score and parts, they put that information in order records. Mm. So I don't have to question if I receive only score because I already know I have something is not going you know, right there. So first off, they did ask for this training and they were really appreciative. They were extremely overwhelmed, but they did learn about, they know about vocal score, listen, they know about vocal score, they know about the full score or partiture, what it is in different language. So I think, and, and they know to question before we start putting uh, in, in the metadata, in ordering metadata editor. Okay, great. So that was, that's nice that they requested it from you. Um, I, I, I know that that can be a challenge. Uh, uh, this is from Gene Hardin. Um, this is more of a, this isn't a question, it's more of a remark. A lot of this would be solved if one, we always put format information in a consistent place, true, and two, yes, that place so was true. indexed. Yes. I agree, Gene. Um, let's let's change the world, huh? Uh, yeah, okay, um, we have another question from David Floyd. In your opinion, what aspects of music cataloging are the most conceptually challenging for non-music specialists? Hmm. Let me think about it. <laughs> yes, yeah, we uh, conceptually what is the most challenging, I think vague information, not enough information. So that this is always challenging. Sometimes we need to write to the publisher and there are new, uh, new ways of uh, notated music being published. 
So the most challenging for us now that we encounter is a composer, I mean, self-published music notated scores. And composers uh, sell, self-publish their music work, and they put on versatile page that uh, accompanying audio recording on tape recording, you know, accessible by this link, and you click on that link and it doesn't work. And then you're afraid you click on this link and it may work for just one person and only for a person who is cataloging like me. And what about other people? So we now are brainstorming about what to do this incoming mixture of uh, electronic publications, how to, what to do about them, how to access them if, it, if they are needed, where, uh, what, where to have a storage for them. So this is a new new realm that, that we, we start encountering. And this is the most challenging. But I think most challenging ever is not having enough information. So clarifying that information always takes time. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, let me see. Uh, here's a question from, wait. Let's jump oh. Tom just Tom has a just a comment. I think it's it's challenging not only teaching staff about content of English OCLC records, but also parallel records, and especially music terms, which Google Translate doesn't work well with. I agree. I That's agree. true. Google Google I Translate agree. sometimes gives you some really weird translations. Uh, yes. For general mm -hmm. terms that we we take for granted. Mm -hmm. um, so Ethan true. asks. Um, were the non-music librarians generally receptive to your training? I think you kind of... Um... I think I covered that, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, not only receptive, but very appreciative. And uh, I am very open and friendly person. They are not afraid to come and ask before we need to redo something. So in the past, it was, you know, they would sit in their cubicle and, and try to do their best and then we would need to you know in in our librarianship work we can always go back we can always correct but i remember my first first training in subject analysis subject training and in original cataloging and this woman she was a very good uh, uh, bibliographic scholar from south carolina she was invited to our library to do the cross training and training or more, everybody in technical services and who deals with uh, cataloging. And uh, she said, catalogers never go back. And I always, it was my, it was my like motto, catalogers never go back, but now I need to live with it. And unfortunately we do need to go back sometimes. Yeah. And to go back. Right. And uh, it looks like Peter, Peter has a, um, has a comment, it looks like, and it makes it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I've often found that when dealing with non-music staff in acquisitions, adding duplicates of the scores is a huge challenge. Um, it's very difficult for someone without a music background to differentiate between a true duplicate and another manifestation of the same piece. Um, it's a comment, but I, I think that's very true. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. it is. And we went all, you know, all uh, felt the consequences of that. Yeah. All right. Well, we're out of time. So thank you, Vanda. Um, this was a, I thank hope you. that you'd be willing thank to share so your slides with us um, at some point. I'm going yes. to try to collect them. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. So yeah, absolutely. I will do that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Kevin, right. for helping me, especially. The beginning. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. All right. So let's, um, I will say now that we are in this section, I'm gonna kick you off the screen, Vanda, if that's yes, okay. Yes, please. Oh yeah, okay. I, I forgot to click leave, sorry. 